Hey, what's up? It's your boy, Bobby Sapphire, and I am here with my boy, Stevie Getz, to talk about one of our favorite decks. Yep. One of our favorite decks, if not our favorite deck, Mono Blue Ray. The best deck that you are not playing. Not you, Steve, because you've been on this for a while. Yeah, man. I love that headline popping up here this morning, seeing that, because pre-Gen Con, I was like, everybody, this is a good deck. I, I know I don't play enough from here, so none of you are going to listen to me. But somebody should play this deck. And while I punted with it, like, I bet you'd have two or three maps right now if you'd listen to me. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Um, and then, so most people play Red Ray. And then we just saw Yellow Ray top eight the Manchester event. What is, like, why is Blue Ray, do you think, better than all of the other options? I think, like, one easy one is, like, when you play Mono, you get the Mono boosted cards, like Vigilance, Sugi wheel yeah i mean uh, that's the obvious answer even though i i think a lot of people aren't sold on Sugi yet i know it took you a while to convince mm -hmm. even after playing the deck however honestly i think the big bonus to it is just the it's able to win the war of attrition that the blue red deck necessarily can't like this deck can go long and it can go real long i mean i decked a palp and a red blue han in gen con and i think between the two i only played one vigilance like it the sustainability is just there and the card draw with quill is like amazingly good yeah and sometimes in those like really long games um you know if you if you draw into really late quills after the game is kind of stabilized and you're kind of doing that trade one for one thing and you can protect him behind a sentinel he can refuel you like in an unbelievable way to get you ahead um so i really like as much as i like the early game quill like the late game quill is also pretty nuts um i yeah, love one of the... <clears throat> sorry go ahead i was just say uh, one of the things i love about the sustainability is just like the restore and the sentinels really let you like reset the game and almost start over with a huge hand like multiple times in a game where most other decks can't do that yeah and there's randomly a lot of card draw like you don't really think about it but Yoda draws you a card. Obi almost always draws you a card. I mean, you have the obvious with Quill, but like the Yoda and Obi extra card just like stacks up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really great. And um, you know, the I think the Red Ray is is good into Han Blue, but is worse into some other matchups that Han Blue is better into, which is like a consideration not to be on Red Ray, but Blue Ray is still good into the Han Two Blue and you gain points in some of the matchups that it's worse against. Like, you don't have that discard package, but sometimes that discard package can be a liability when our opponents are sideboarding in, like, Palps Returns and stuff, or playing the main For deck. Sure. I, I'd say my entire sideboard at Gen Con consisted of three Force Throws. That might have been, like, the only card I boarded in all uh, day long, and they were super underwhelming. Yeah. Like, even if I had been paying one for them and not three... I still don't think it would have mattered. Yeah, I mean, I liked him, but we're going to talk about it when we get to our sideboards. Uh, all right, well, that's our brief intro. Now we're going to check out uh, the decks. All right, we're going to start by looking at the low drops here. Um, I separated these by one and two cost because I think both, or I think you said it, and I've and I kind of agree that like other than being on the play with Queel, I'd much rather be dropping one drop and buffing, right? Like even if it's Moisture Farmer. I've been. And that was, I think, the biggest pivot I've made since Gen Con. Like, Gen Con was always just slam a quill no matter what. Now, I, not only have I added another one drop in for my list of 2-1-B, but I've really focused on going one drop experience token turn one, even if I do have a quill. Because then you can just go quill to another experience token and really maximize your mana or uh, resources, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, I found like having that, like especially R two, he when he becomes a three six, like he's a problem to deal with. Yeah, R two's great. I mean, I think he's the ideal one, um, turn one play. Uh, certainly on the draw, I still prefer to go Quill on the play um, if it's something that can't kill him right away. Like I know that if I can, if I'm not going to get ECL'd or McClunkied or something, like I would rather slam Quill and draw the card, and um, I even potentially depending on the matchup might even be able to buff him turn two 
before I draw the card and then drop something else. Um, I think in general, restored arc is probably the worst, but it's also just a necessary evil to like be able to start trading with things in space. Um, you can just drop it on turn one and then buff it the following turn or drop it and buff it at any point to start killing the three HP ships. For sure. I agree with you there. Um, restored arc is probably the most underwhelming, but you really need to make sure you're hitting something on two or turn one, I guess I should say, um, to apply that pressure. Yeah, and then talk to me about 2-1-B, because that's a card that most people think is complete draft chaff. Uh, how often are you getting the on-attack heal, and um, like because it's only on another unit, as opposed to like Embo or something that can heal himself, Like, d does that no. text ever come become relevant? Rarely, I'll say that. The 2-1-B is more about having a good one-drop to play and give an experience token to. So you can start with a 2-4. Um, yeah, so like he was originally Val. Um, that's what I was playing in Gen Con, but I switched over to him. Um, I like the fact that it's a threat. So like what ends up happening a lot of the times is you stick an early threat, you get a little bit of tempo, and they have to deal with the early play, which allows your later plays to have a little bit more resilience to what they got going on. So I'd say like, I very rarely use the heal too. I mean, when you do, it's obviously a bonus, but he's more in there to be a two, four on turn one, potentially a three, five on turn two, and just to apply that pressure. Cause the thing is, is while you may rarely actually get the heal, they actually have to deal with him right or else he starts compounding when you do get units out yeah exactly and that's the same thing with r2 like why r2 is so good like they have to deal with him otherwise he'll snowball either one of these and if they do deal with him then that means something else later on is going to live and that thing that's going to live is probably better yeah and it like you do have to like have a one cost guy to be able to get like that turn three three power thing cranking so um is 2-1-b the only other option it's got to be right what's that is three is 2-1-b the only other one cost option for us i believe so yeah. at least the only thing that i've saw i really wish the moisture farmer was just a one four or even a one three yeah and like it would just i i just can't deal with the zero <laughs> Yeah, I still I still like it. I still prefer it um, sometimes uh, to be just be to be on that one cost plus buff plan. But uh, it's also one that they can't ignore, you know. So even when it doesn't uh, like swing the third turn or whatever, it did soak usually like five or six damage because most decks like have to deal with it at some point, even though it can be generally free for them. All right, moving into the three costs. These are all what's in our deck. I guess I could have looked at other cards that we didn't really include, but th these three cards are such a staple um, that they're all three ofs, and I can't imagine like fitting in an Embo when we have these three amazing cards to, to play every every ta every game. Yeah, they're just they're money in the bank. Um, one of the things I the Embo is interesting. I honestly never even looked at them. Um, it wouldn't, I wouldn't object to maybe fitting in a one of like I, one of the things, and I've said this a couple times now on stream, one of the biggest mistakes I think I made with this deck was just playing everything three X and then two of us, a two X of the final card, right? A clean build drink. of like all three of yeah. yeah, because with the sustainability of a deck and the amount of card draw, having a little bit more variety. Yeah. Some spice there. Yeah, because you can definitely find those one and two of cards. And a lot of the times during my games at Gen Con, I found that my hands were just too clunky. I just had too many high cost cards. I had too many of the same card. And it really, my resourcing wasn't smooth enough. And I didn't have that variety where, you know, you could probably, while I don't think Embo comes close to any one of these three cards, you could definitely try Embo out and slot a one of or a two of in there somewhere. Um, and he could get some value out of that. A lot of the times I find myself playing a three drop on four plus an experience token on something as opposed to a, a true four drop. So there's definitely a lot of wiggle room there. Yeah, and I think that's probably the thing that's hardest about playing Ray is like when to do that under drop. Um, but these are the cards that make it really simple, right? Like, all right, I yeah. need a Sentinel. Well, I've got 
the best ground sentinel on three and the best space sentinel on three like i don't need anything else like you can really just hold these until you need them or you know you can just run them out if it's really beneficial to you um there's nothing quite like dropping the village protectors on three and then like following it up with a yoda and making him a three five and then he becomes like a real monster that they have to deal with and then you get to draw the card while you're restoring two. absolutely um, and there's not much to say else about these. Like, Conquer Dawn Interceptors, after you get an experience token on it, is just absolutely a monster. Um, even um, a Delphi Starwing can't take it out um, without help. Trades with... Uh... No, it doesn't trade. Never mind. Yeah, it's but it's... Tra- but, I mean, three yeah, three defense and... Trade with uh, the Fire Spray, two experience tokens? Uh, no, right? Because that would only be five. Oh, it's a five six. Yeah, but you. But the thing is, even if it's something huge like that, it puts it into things like takedown range, make an opening range, like a, right. a second one will follow it up. Uh, a arc will kill it. Like this is just such a pain in the butt to deal with. It shuts down so many. Um, it's just space attacks. For sure. All right. Now we get into four drops, and um, the ones on the left are the ones that we play. We both play. So we talked a little bit about Sugi in the intro, but this is a card that, like, I was off for Nema Constables, but more and more as I just, like, slammed it out on four as a four-cost Sentinel, and then, like, also it allowed me to, um, if I had one in my row, and, like, I didn't have to keep my Obi-Wans in hand. Like, I could resource them if I had a difficult decision because it can just come and be an Obi-Wan on six as well. Um, It's just great. And then there are so many option like there's so many cards that come in upgraded that Sugi is oftentimes very few times where i'm like man i wish Sugi was a sentinel and she's not yeah for sure like i think when the first glance at most people and i think probably you did the same thing it's like well she's only good if they're upgraded well in this set there's so many upgrades but for me almost always i'm resourcing her like i get so many clunky hands that have like a two drop or a one drop, and then you have like Chewbacca and another card, or Sugi another card. Being able to know that you can just resource her just smooths out the draw so much. Um, and the uh, up until probably I think it was round three at Gen Con, I was under the assumption that she cost seven to smuggle, <laughs> until my opponent pointed out that it was only six. Um, so if I'm playing her for seven, you better believe I'm going to play her for six. Hell yeah. Uh, and then Kanan, some people struggle with Kanan, but like he's milling, he's healing, he's got four attack, he doesn't die to four force, he doesn't die to like K2. Like I've always liked Kanan and think he's just underrated. It just like when you're on your back foot, it can be hard to slam a four drop. Yeah, and I think he's probably the one thing I took away from what you had been playing over the past uh, month. Because originally I had no Kanans. When I went to Gen Con, they were all Rose. Um, and while I think Rose is still great, like after you told me I should be playing Kanan to help with the mill, like even outside of the mill, he's just a strong unit and he gives you another target for Obi-Wan, which is huge. Um, right now my list is playing like a variety of Rose, Nima and Kanan just because I'm trying to find out what the optimal numbers are and I haven't gotten there yet, but I think there's some combo of that where they're all really strong. They're just very situational. Yeah, and obviously Kanan in this deck is only milling one, right? So we're not using it to like be on some crazy mill strategy. But in a long, grindy game, like those things add up, especially when you can do things like combine them with um, with Vigilance. And one of the things that I have in my list is, which is why the rate will, because I have the Razor Crest in my list, is I have a second chance in my main deck and another one in my sideboard, because I have these situations and these matchups where I'm like, okay, if I can actually um, get my opponent to tap out, maybe with um, like a super laser blast, or they have to pay to like a, a rival's fall to deal with some beast, like I can just slam Kane in second chance, and that ends up being like a significant amount of cards that I can mill in those grindy matchups. And Razor Crest allows me to do that. Um, like a second time, you know, because if we're, if we're thinking about doing it on eight, um, I can raise a crest second chance on an Obi Wan or a Luke in some matchups. And like, it just, like, even if a deck is trying to match you on value, like, they can't match 
four Lukes. You know what I mean? And and like no. with Razor Crest, it could be five. And then the other reason I have Razor Crest in here is because in my sideboard I have top targets for even more healing. And then I get to play multiple top targets because Razor Crest gets those back and it has re um, restore two as well. And it's also just That's a three four for killing a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I haven't tried the Razor Crest at all. I did have uh, some second chances in over the course of the past month. Um, but I really like that top target second top top target razor crest plan you just mentioned. I think I might have to try that coming out of the board. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, I was already just testing the razor crest second chance thing to see if I liked it, and it's pretty inconsistent. So I dropped down from having two of each to just having one of each and moved the other two to the board. But I liked keeping the razor crest. Um, and the two of Razor Crest 2 and the 60, because I knew I wanted to be on that top target plan. Um, it's pretty insane how much healing you do when you like top target something, you let it hit you, and then you vigilance it, you heal 11, and then you Razor Crest and get another one back, and you put it on like their A-Wing, and then you're restoring you know, another 8 or 6 or whatever. It's it's crazy. Makes me want to play, makes me think of uh, the mono white life gain deck where it's just like you, you heal this much amount, you get to this amount of life and you just automatically win the game. I know, we need, what's the guy, like Felidar Sovereign or whatever, get to 40 life and auto win, wasn't that a card? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, need, I think that's right. we need that. When you when yeah. you get to dust your base off, you win the game. <laughs> um, and then, so you're still playing Rose. Have you liked Rose just slow casting her as a 2-6 um, shielded? I do. Um, I've found that she's really great on initiative on turn four and she's not that great when you're not on it um the fact that they can there's a lot of pinging um in the set like that they can just remove the shield but just whenever you turn her into a four eight she's just disgusting and even if they burn something to remove the shield you can still give her experience token and a three seven for four isn't bad yeah and that's what i liked about the nemo outpost constables is like they could brick them on sick on four as the six health guy and then if you, if they couldn't kill it right away you could potentially buff it into something that they still can't kill when you make it a three seven so um i like that i think the number one thing that this list is missing in general because like um, i guess vigilance gives us that but we don't have a way to shield up our guys unless we play like we're both on the 30 point base like obviously you could play the 25 mm -hmm. point base but like this, all of these guys become so much more problematic with shields that it makes me want to think about like other shields, like um, public enemy potentially if we're on a razor crest plan, right? Like if we are able to use the bounty to put shields on our guys, um, that could be really good. I do use vigilance to put a shield on something. Um, I'll generally like healed shield, uh, heal shield, I do. a lot. I, what I do, what I find myself doing more often than anything with the vigilance is defeat shield because there's so many games you need you use it just to defeat something and you're already at like zero life yeah or you're at such a low life total because you have so much restore right that the shield is just like a bonus um which is why i still like playing a couple roses also she although the i'd say it happens rarely kind of like with the 2-1-b when she turns the village protectors into a 4-4 it's always just like a nice little added bonus yeah, it's great that she can do that with, with the whole team. All right, looking into the five and six. So I don't play any five drops. You are playing currently one Ray, um, but I did want to just kind of include the six cost stuff in here to talk about um, because for me, it's just like Obi-Wan or bust. And on five, I'm generally dropping another four drop and buffing or playing a removal and buffing something else or trying to get basically two actions in um, because I want to get a little bit ahead on the board so that when I do drop Obi, they don't just kill him right away and he doesn't buff something. Um, and then um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about Ray and why she's making your list currently? Yeah, I think you really hit the nail right on the head there. At Gen Con, I was playing three Rays and I actually lost a game, which I think I would have won um, at like 3-0 or I was 3-1 or something like that against Yellow Bulber where I played Ray on five where I should have just played a two drop in Village Protectors. Like I wasn't even, I was in, had such tunnel vision that I didn't even see the waylay. Like I played Ray, they waylaid and I ended up losing on the turn I was going to stabilize. Right. I lost to a smuggled snapshot blaster. Yeah, because and you just fallen played, behind, yeah. Yeah, if I had played the two and the three drop, I'm pretty sure I would have won that. 
probably would have gotten me a mat. But like that's why I said, if a better player than me plays this, you're in good shape. However, uh, I do like the Singleton Ray um, in a lot of the grindy matchups. Um, not so much the matchups where you're worried about getting the waylay. Like she's just great, and the fact that she randomly will interact with Sugi and two one B, giving them shields. Um, I think it's a great one of card along those lines of, you know, you can find the cards that you need, but, it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't err on the side of all wanting to play her on five. I think you're completely right where you say you want to do two actions on five. So you have a little bit more of a board presence so you can do line up that turn six Obi-Wan Ray. Yeah. Um, I like the idea of getting shields on guys. It's just like, I don't know when I play her, you know, like, to me, I look at her and I'm like, man, I, 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 may, I might start playing her on nine, right? And, like, in that consideration, I probably just don't want her. But I do see, like, when the opportunity presents itself. And, like, obviously you got to be disciplined about that. But, like, when you when you do have these one-ofs, they're in there because, like, okay, in this one certain situation, it's going to be great. And you just keep an eye out for that. And otherwise, it's just a land. Like, you just think about it as an auto resource. Um I don't know if you had any thoughts on these other cards, like between Mando, Cargo Juggernaut, and Bendu, like I would probably want to play Cargo Jugs over the other two. Um, I've seen people rock Bendu as the four seven Sentinel, which certainly isn't bad, um, but I don't think there's enough value out of the on attack to like really care. And in that case, like I'd probably go Mando over. Bendu, if I just wanted another Sentinel, because he can't be bounced with Cunning with the five power, even if I never get to double shield a low drop. Yeah, I had Cargo Jugs in the board for Sabine at Gen Con, although I never actually played any Sabine. Um, I really wish Mandalorian was better or like had more applicable abilities to this deck. Um, what I find myself doing on six is almost always obi-wan like i yeah. will never resource an obi-wan like i will hold him the entire <laughs> game like just to play him like the other thing that i find myself doing is if i don't have a like a real strong play if i don't have the obi-wan on six i'll be resourcing sugi out a lot as like that six as my six cost card yeah that's um, why i include bendu, her in the slide yeah yeah bendu's cute um whether you actually need the cargo jugs against Sabine, I don't know. Um, I haven't actually played any sideboard matches with that. I mean, my guilty pleasure is best of ones, um, which is probably why I did so bad in games two and games three at Gen Con. Uh, but I do think, like, every game you want to be slamming Obi-Wan on six. Yeah, I agree. I think Mandalorian's an interesting consideration, especially in a really grindy game, um, you know, ideally not even to play on six like he's a good backup for six but we already have that in sugi but being able to like in a grindy game on eight go mandalorian a quill into mandalorian or something um to yeah, like make sure we draw some cards i think that could be really good i think like if i was going to do a singleton in this arena i might make it the mandalorian that's a great call you know i what i'm going to do i'm going to start play testing one of in the in my decks just to see how that works out let's go all right, and then we get the late game. You've recently cut Redemptions, um, but we, obviously Luke Skywalker, one of, if not the best legendary in the game. Like, he's insane. He kills things that otherwise can't be killed, like Lurking Tie Phantom. He is something that can kill Snoke. Like, he just kills everything. And then we got Chewbacca is a takedown on a stick. And, like, you think Chewbacca's, like, kind of whatever, but then, like, anytime there's a 410 on the board and, you, and you're like, oh, I, I don't actually have a way to deal with a 410. And if I do try and deal with it, uh, like, that thing's going gonna, gonna to swing for, like, nine before I do. So Chewbacca's been really great. Amazing. And, like, the other thing that people probably sleep on a lot with Chewbacca and <laughs> I've had a lot of success is... Smuggle you know, 11? Get, well, I do smuggle. I always I smuggle. I smuggle. I, I want to say this. I smuggle him a lot. Uh, I was going to go with another la t line there, but either way. Um, you can get him to 10 power pretty easily. And once he's hit that 10 power, he does trade with the crate. And like that does become relevant. Um, I played a game yesterday against um, one of the tournament testing tier players. He was playing blue. He was playing blue red ray. And I had to fight through two of his crates. Um, and while it didn't become applicable in the situation, like having 
turning on the 10 power Chewy to trade is like huge. And also if he's out there and you play a fell on their crate, like they're going to have to dome you in the face, which is basically just like a waste, or they're going to just trigger the Chewbacca grit. Right. Like having that, that 10 uh, booty. booty absorb. Yeah. Just like it really can. It's a really great answer in a lot of ways to crate, which a lot of people I've noticed have been both boarding in and main decking because they think it's a great answer for this matchup. Mm -hmm. And then I still like redemption because healing eight and like being able to do it from any number of units or bases, like that's so relevant. And it's something that I think like, I don't know if people forget it, but it's like, Oh, okay. I'll take like, you know, I'll clean up my Obi-Wan and heal four or, you know what I mean? Like kill, like clear up a Sentinel and heal some off the base or just like the eight, the full eight off your base and soak a, an attack in space like it's just a game ender it's like almost a full stabilization unless you're you're so far behind um and even when you're so far behind it can still be the thing that claws you back for sure i definitely think it's probably a punt on my part not playing any at the moment um i definitely wanted to try out some other cards at one and two of to see how they interacted and if there was value there um the other thing gr that's great with the redemption too is against the Palpatines, the Kira's, things along those lines, it does have six attack. So yeah. it can... It hits. You can run out there, soak up something, and then all those Star Destroyers now become in takedown range. Yeah, and, and not only that, but just, like, people sleep on the fact that, like, you can close out a game quickly with this deck. Once you reach these seven, eight cost guys, like, you start having bombs that can just start ending the game quick. Like, or if you if you get an Obi-Wan trigger to, like, put two experience tokens on anything, and then you follow it up with anything in this slide, like, you end the game really quickly. It's a deck that, like, I think too many people, um, like, forget to turn that corner and win the game, and this deck can do that. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been games I've played where I'm attacking in their units in the mid to late game and like trying to get board advantage. I'm just like, if I'm just swinging at their base, yeah. there's no way they're going to be able to race me because I have the restore. So I definitely think that's an often overlooked aspect in something I do myself. Yeah, just mash face. Um, and then I don't even think like one thing I wanted to mention real quickly is just like, it's not a punt to not run something right now, you know? Like, you're testing it out. Like, you know Redemption. Like, if it was an event and you think it's the right move, you're going to throw the Redemptions in the board. But it's great to be testing other things. So um, one thing that I think, like, is, a, like, the all these cards are in, right? Like, we're never going to zero of these cards. Um, Vigilance is an easy three of. And then you could make a case for one or two of the others. So I'm, I honestly, I, I'm waiting, curious to see what, the slide is of my deck list because i don't know if i still have rivals fall in there in the main oh okay I, I, li I like it but i just like it because um it like this deck can deal with everything uh via health total it, and then the things that it can't like rivals fall just kills you know correct the big and i was playing two two to three of them i think at gen con the problem i was running into is six is just such an awkward number for the deck because, like, more often than not, when you're playing the Rivals Fall, I found, is against, like, those grindy matchups. And it's usually on, like, turn 10 or turn 9, like, against a, a Walker or Star Destroyer or something along those lines. And the problem I was running into was I could play the Rivals Fall, but that was the only thing I could play that turn. Like, once I, I was even going so far as to say, like, I'd almost rather play a Vanquish over the Rivals Fall just because that one extra resource gives you the ability to play two two things in a turn, and that is huge once you get to that late game. Yeah, for me, this is like Ray, like Ray's a leader. Like, think about why Kira is good, right? Because she kills almost every leader out there. Ray doesn't kill any leaders, so like our deck isn't good at taking leaders out. And so, what I think of like a, what's a hole I need to fill with my event package? It's it's defeating a, a, any unit, including leaders. That's how I kind of think of it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, here are some other cards that are uh, in our decks at some in some level, except neither of us are on Jedi lightsaber, but that's a card that continues to intrigue me. I personally go with the forces with me because I like that I can get the attack without giving my opponent an option. But there's no doubt that like with all the force units we have, that the lightsaber, even though you can't attack with it as you play it, like it's really really strong and i wondered if you hadn't tested it or considered it at all i ha i haven't tested it at all um but it, it looks spicy af 
Like, I think I need to be testing. I mean, it. there are there are matchups where Yoda just wins the game when he has the lightsaber. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even mind throwing that on R two. You get like a three six R two, slam that on him. Now mm -hmm. you're what six nine back to like playing like that shirt type deck Justin was playing for a while. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of applicable situations for that. Um, that's another card I'm going to start testing at least one of. I'll yeah, throw that one. In the next couple of weeks too and we kind of already talked about the top target second chance but um i wanted to give some time to to think about upgrades and how like buffing our guys can be really strong um, i'm still running one the forces with me i can't ever see going down to zero just because in the games where you are able to and you do have the board presence to to do that attack and shield up your guy it, it's really strong yeah i had um i had a in the deck pre gen con but then when we got to Gen Con that morning and decided to play after swearing I wasn't going to, I didn't have any. So it kind of just fell out the way. And I guess I never really went back to it. But um, it's really, I think the most important thing that you touched upon is the fact that you can cheat priority with it. Yeah. Like it gives you two options in one. And this deck is probably, is really bad about keeping initiative because of all the actions that you use to upgrade. Um, so being able to, have a way to cheat that i think is really important yeah and it works with any unit like you know it doesn't have to be a force unit you can you can go for the kill with anything or you can take something out with anything um which is really good but you should have just asked me i had we had all our cards there yeah i just wasn't all right happy. here are some other interesting cards in the sideboard i think i think i don't have make an opening main because like we have so much life gain and we have ways to deal with lurking tie phantom um you're currently on crate dragon in the board i'm currently on force throw on the board we already talked a little bit about force throw but i generally like it as a as another way to deal with leaders right i'm targeting myself and i'm, I'm you know force throwing my own chewbacca or or redemption or something to take out a boba fett but talk to me about why you like crate dragon there's crates in there for those long grindy games and like other than Boba Yellow and Sabine, all the other games go long. And like I can't tell you how many times I resource Chewy smuggle Chewy out at eleven resources. Um, I do have to give uh, props to I think his name's Jeremy Jeremiah or something like that. My uh, winning an opponent on the last round at Gen Con, he was playing blue red Han, um, and we kind of got to chatting a little bit afterwards at the the hangout that night. And he, he gave me the idea to put crate in the board. Cause like there's, all, I'd say 90% of the games you're getting to 11 resources. <laughs> and like, I kind of just got sick and tired of fighting through two and three crate dragons myself that like, why not just join? Um, and I think that while it's expensive, you can definitely get there. And I think the fact that you have so many threats already, like the fact that they have to deal with the Obi Wan Force Jedi unit Force unit turn, like they have they have to answer your threats. Yeah, all the way it up buys you so game. many turns when you get that off. Yeah, so then by the time you slam that, what are they going to have left? Yeah, I I don't hate the idea. It's just I ninety percent of my games aren't going to eleven. I think I work a little bit harder to close the game out quicker. Um, but if I was finding all my games going that long, then I would definitely consider the crate dragon. Fair enough. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Nah, I mean, you're still crushing baby. Uh, all right. Here's some cards that here's some events that we don't play, but I think are good. Um, well, I'm not sure that they're good. Like I think covert strength is good, but is it ever good enough to actually put in over what we have? Same with mystic reflection. Like there are often like if you can't get the minus two minus two like mystic reflection is bad like i don't think we ever want to be playing it for the minus two minus oh so like is it like that that ability to do that for one is so strong but i just can't see myself playing something as inconsistent as that i'll say this when about 10 minutes before we started recording this mike walked me through all the slides and the first thing i said was like "Ooh, i've been thinking a lot about that card but i'm just too lazy to try it out um, I do think there's some sauciness in that Mystic Reflection. I think you have enough Force units that it will almost always trigger. Uh, it's definitely worth trying out, um, especially considering I've struggled against Yellow Boba uh, when they're main decking Forlom and Zuckus. 
And I think they're kind of getting a little bit ahead of the curve by doing that. So trying to figure something else out in terms of shrinking some of those guys or just getting a little bit more tempo in the early game. Um, I definitely think it's there. Uh, I've never tried the it binds all things. Um, kind of feels a little too situational to me. I still do like Vanquish, um, but that's just me. Yeah, I, I that's the thing about these cards is that other than Vanquish, they're all just a little bit too situational for me. Um, especially with the healing cards. Like, I'd like to heal, but, I mean, I don't know how you... When I play the game, I'm just like, I put a unit out, I'm like, this guy's already dead. <laughs> I'm not even going to start thinking about whether or not I can keep him alive or live through anything. I just assume that whenever I play a guy, he's going to die immediately. And so it's hard for me to wrap my head around, like, playing events that rely on my guys living a long time. So that's sort of where I'm at with these cards. But I think they have inherent strength, and they're worth playing if you find situations for them. One of the things that I always tell people, and like our subs, is, like, if you like a card and you think you know when to play it, or it creates lines that you want to play, then you should definitely play it. All right, so here's your list. You do have a Rivals Fall in there, which is why I had it on this slide. Um, oh, one card that I didn't, I must have forgotten to put on a slide, or maybe I skipped it, was Tech. So let's let's take a second to talk about Tech. Yeah, you know, I wasn't playing Tech at Gen Con, and I think that was a mistake, uh, especially against those control decks, like when people are playing Palpatine. I ran into a lot of Palpatine. I played like three Palpatines in the same There was so much was Palpatine like, at Gen Con, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, the other thing too, it's like relevant after this video is tech is great in the mirror. Like, are we going to get to the point where we got to start thinking about the mirror a little bit and like, maybe not even so much the mirror, but just those mid range decks. Like I think would you say yesterday there was a green Boba that went undefeated. Mm -hmm. in yeah. It UK. won the whole event. Yep. Yeah. So like any of those like mid range grindy type decks, like he's just a stud, you know, and it's another car. I love cards with smuggle mostly because i feel like i don't do a great job of choosing cards to resource i mean there was a lot of games at gen con where one or two turns later i was like oh i wish i had resourced something different so like being able to like have that smuggle card there and resource whatever i want kind of just gives me a little bit of a hedge and like that might be a my own little mind game i'm playing with myself uh, but he definitely he's another threat that has to be dealt with yeah, Otherwise, and you just get out of control. he's just a great card to play. Like, one of my signals for him is like, oh, my opponent tapped out. Can it, can I get tech out, and will that let me play two turns? Um, when you start playing things from your resource row, and you have tech, um, and you have more than one tech, so like even if they kill the first one, like you're you're essentially drawing cards, and like that's what makes tech so good in a grindy matchup is because he's putting cards in your resource row that you can actually play. So it's essentially him drawing you cards. Um, so I, I really like tech as well. And the other thing I think to note is, um, oh, and if um, if the mirror matches do come, you got to play tech and then you got to buff him uh, immediately with Ray to get him out of Chewy and take down range. And then he's not in fell range either. And he just becomes a, a, a monster. And you're going to yeah. wish you had that rival's fall. Um, the You have three takedowns and three fell the dragons. And if we switch to my list, um, I am only playing two of those cards. I'm playing one rival's falls. And um, for me, those slots become like the second chance and the forces with me um, in terms of like the utility stuff within the deck. Yeah. And I think that kind of just goes back to the point that we mentioned earlier was like, there's a lot of flexibility with this deck. You can play one, you can play like four to five card slots of things you think are good. And more importantly, things you think are going to be good this weekend. Yeah. Like, if you're going to a 1K or whatever the tournament, a planetary qualifier this weekend, and you feel like you have a good read on the meta at your local shop, five, five or six cards in here can change to, to accommodate that. So, it definitely gives you the room to try to be ahead of the curve. Yeah. Next level next level your opponents the weekend for sure. If I thought like my whole meta was going to be Sabine's, like it would be easy to cut, um, like second chance some Chewbacca's and like put in and, and like put in the top targets main deck or something, you know, like really skew the, towards that. The only thing I'd really say is you should definitely try playing three fell the dragons. That's been like such an amazing card for me. Um, yeah. I've had to become like, very patient and not resourcing it um, is basically how I look at it. It's like a never resource for me. Agreed. And like, there's so many matchups where 
you're going to want to play it on like turns six, five, six, or somewhere in that mid game, but you need to be saving it for the, those big bombs. Cause inevitably speaking, like you don't lose this, this deck never really loses in the mid game. It either gets like completely stomped early. Cause you just can't keep up with the tempo and like, it might just be a Sabine God draw or you get outclassed by some big star destroyers and things like that in the late game. But like that middle game, like just taking out a random six attack thing generally isn't going to make or break the matchup, but having that for the star destroyers late game or the crate dragons, things along those lines have been huge for me. Cool. All right. Well, we'll cut it there. Somehow talked for 40 minutes about this stuff. So, um, uh, like obviously we think a lot about this deck and we think very highly of the deck. Um, this is certainly in my consideration of cards to play at, uh, my PQ that's upcoming. Um, until I start consistently losing with it, it's always going to be in consideration for me. It's like, it's the deck I currently feel the most comfortable with against everything. Yeah. Knowing that I'll probably be playing three techs for my one K deck list. Uh, when I go to see nice. you there, I'll be on the two Bye. second chances. There you go. We'll All see right. what's better. All right. GG's. Let it in.